Welcome back to the French Rugby Podcast with me, Tim Groves, ex-Scotland international and adopted Frenchman, Johnny BT. And we're going to be joined by former England international and now Toulon prop, Kieran Brooks, to look ahead to La Crunch and chat about how life's going in the top 14 too. We will come to that England-France game in a minute, Johnny. But how are things with you? Because we haven't really caught up since we recorded last week. And all I'm seeing is pictures of you on the beach with champagne and it's absolutely freezing here. Uh, guilty. Guilty as charged. It's, re- it's really nice here, mate. And it's meant to be 20, it gets up to 24 by the end of this week. Um, but if it makes you feel any better, I'll be coming back to Scotland to watch Scotland, okay. Ireland, and it's going to be absolutely Baltic. Um, so yeah, don't worry. No, it's been nice. It has been really nice. And uh, it's been nice to have a little break as well in between the sort of travel and back and forth to all the games. Um, and the champagne was a little bit of celebration. So started a new job with World Rugby this week, mate, which is pretty cool. Congratulations. Um, so thank you. Um, no idea what I'm going to be doing or why they've employed me, um, <laughs> but looking forward to it. It should be really cool. Loads to get stuck into and all about growing the game, growing involvement, um, growing the investment and the revenue across everyone with participation. So looking forward to it, mate. It should be really, really cool. This is going to be interesting. We can ask you every week now about all the problems with rugby all over the world and you'll have answers, yeah? Mate, all of them. I'll have answers straight away. Um, if I can't answer, um, you defer to Jim Hamilton. He's also signed oh God. up as well. Oh God. <laughs> exactly. It shows the depths they've gone to, mate. They really are taking us from all places. <laughs> um, so no, mate, should be cool. Um, we're off today. This week, we're all at home. The kids, it's a strike in France. So the kids are all at home. Teachers are on strike. Dinner ladies are at strike. So I'm up there making sandwiches and early learning center in the morning it's absolute carnage <laughs> which brings us back to you mate yeah. life was a four ball the youngest ones arrived recently how's it going be honest how honest harrowingly honest well this is the thing you're always going to be one step ahead so however bad it is surely you've got it worse one worse but all i'm saying is we spoke before we started recording you said it was genuinely shit <laughs> <laughs> which i don't believe i don't believe at all um no it's lovely it's absolutely brilliant i i i'm loving every second of it <laughs> i don't know why i'm saying this the better half doesn't listen so i can say what i want i can be actually exactly honest. exactly and everyone at home is it carnage sleeping no sleeping I mean, three months old and three years old are the ages. I, I don't know if there's any worse Great stage. stage to be at. Enjoy it, mate. <laughs> oh. it's, um, I'm sleeping more. Um, the little one's sleeping a little bit better. But yeah, like one's completely dependent on you and the other one is um, attempting to be independent, but clearly can't be. And you're still fully dependent on the missus and it goes full circle and it never ends. <laughs> there we go. It'll never change. No one's dependent on me, that's for sure. Oh man, good fun. Anyway, Le Crunch. Mm -hmm. France have just about ticked everything off over the past year or two in terms of their accomplishments. Things are looking a little bit rockier in terms of their form over the past few weeks, but they haven't won at Twickenham in the Six Nations since 2005. So is this kind of another big sort of hill that they can look to and say, look, we haven't done this. So it really focuses the mind. Do you know what, mate? They haven't won there. And I, this is from memory. I reckon it was Dimitri Yashvili that knocked over yes, something like it was, 20 yeah, points. Yeah. Like, yeah. Freakish. So maybe it's going to take somebody standing up and doing something a little bit out of the ordinary. Um, weirdly, though, like their chances of going there and winning are as good as they've ever been, I would say. Mm. Like, I reckon this game's a 50-50. This isn't the dominance of English packs that we've seen in years past. But then if we're honest, this also isn't the dominant French side that we've seen over the past 24 months. So... Um, I'd say both sides have been uncharacteristically a little bit unconvincing. Would that be fair? Um, and I think realistically, France has got, they've got as good a chance as they as they have done in the past decade or so of going over there. So I'm looking forward to it. Weirdly, I'll be really intrigued to see what changes in the way they play and their approach. Um, but in terms of physicality, set piece, the nuts and bolts of the game, um, they'll be there or thereabouts, mate. So potentially a record that can be broken. Um, and they'll be looking forward to writing a little piece of history. Um, and Fabian's great at that. We saw him last week as well, doing bits referring constantly to the French Legionnaires and stuff they do and their mentality. And that's it. You'll see this as a look. We haven't been superb. We've stumbled a little bit, but here's a chance to go over. And it was two years ago during COVID where there was a phenomenal game of rugby. Um, it was ridiculous to watch the quality of what they produce. So I, I think they'll go there without fear. Um, a realisation that if they click and if they start to get things right, they can absolutely win. So, uh, yeah, a real chance for them this weekend. 
And what is the sense in France? Because there's a lot of chat about the fact that they haven't been in the best form over their opening few games. Mm -hmm. Is there a concern there or is it just a kind of, we'll be all right? And then also when we've spoken in recent weeks about the French game, what do you think the kind of areas are where the game will be won and lost? Because England do seem very forward oriented under Borthwick. So, so firstly, I guess, is the, the the worrying part. So I think everyone in agreement over here sees and feels is the fatigue element, is that that is very real. Because for top 14 players, for French players, they play more minutes than any other league. Like You look at all the other federations, the Irish boys barely play in the URC. They play mm. Champions Cup rugby and international rugby. Um, Greg's already got through like way more than a thousand minutes with La Rochelle. So I think people understand that that is normal and it's natural that they seem a little bit less on top or firing than other nations do because they're primed to peak at these times whereas the french boys aren't they're, they're built to grind through a season because the the clubs pay the salaries interestingly i was on the plane up for i was doing a top 14 game at the weekend i was doing racing against toulouse and i was on the plane up um with a bunch of the conditioners and the analysts who all live in Biarritz, they live in this area and they go back and forth to Marcusi. Um, now they're based up there for the remainder of the tournament, not in Capriton. They were just saying, look, they had the boys on holiday or like they had them under their remit with a French side. Like they didn't give them back to the clubs. They put them all on holiday. They're like, yeah. they realize how it's not like they've been doing training camps or topping ups or like working on their play. It's, these guys are tired. They need a rest. They need a break. And that's what they got. So they got a week fully off um, this week, or sorry, last week, and they'll come back in this week to prep and then fly over to play Twickenham. So um, that is the bit I think everyone, the consensus, everyone sees that, they understand that, and they know that's a point of difference in the top 14. The secondary point is just the way that they're playing um, and how other teams seem to have sussed out how to sort of spook or how to get under the skin of the French side and they look easier to play against. Previously, they were much more dominant physically um, and with ball in hand. And now actually, if you keep the ball on the field, if you remove the structure from the game, is it easier to play against France? But that again, the secondary problem, whether it's journalists or like people on the street, you're chatting about the game at the weekend, they're like, now's as good a time as any to have that problem. You don't want that during the World Cup. We've lost that game against Ireland. The Grand Slam's gone. So now it's a problem solve. How can this coaching team and the players evolve how can they show different layers to the game and how can they add to what we've seen already in the past 24 months which has been physicality organization but now it has to be even more detail you saw the way ireland created their chances the best team in the world with ball in hand going through multi-phase france now is can you evolve and can you get one step better so that come world cup time you can really compete so i'd say those are the two areas um but that's the time for problem solvers and fixers and people to find solutions Let's bring our guest in now and we can get his view on the game this weekend as well as chatting all things Toulon. England international Kieran Brooks joins us. How are you doing? I'm very, very good, thanks. How are you guys? We're all right. We're all right. We were chatting about Le Crunch this weekend. So as an Englishman who now knows French rugby very well, played yeah. against a lot of these players, what's your view on the game? Where's it going to be won and lost and who edges it? I think it's going to be won up front. I think most games most games are, aren't they? And I think the, the French pack is pretty formidable. Um, but I think it's going to be close. I think um, you know, Borthwick's Borthwick's brought a bit, bit of um, motivation back to the England team. They're playing well. Um, you know, they've got some players that are kind of um, hitting form, and I think it's going to be a hell, hell of a game. Yeah. And talk us through those key front row b- battles, mate, because you played against most of them. Potentially yeah. Dorian Aldegheri coming in and starting this weekend up yeah. against Genji. Uh, Serial Bai up against Kyle Sinclair. Like, what do you make of those key battles and how they'll end up going? Me personally, that's gonna they're gonna be the best battles of the of the day of the day. Hundred percent. Um yeah, I think um Genji's a very, very good player. Um and I think he might edge it in a in a scrum up front. Um I think I think his impact around the pitch is enormous for England as well. I think um the speed that we've got in our back three um thrives off space and I think people players like Genji and Sinclair getting England over the over the gain line and creating space for them. Is going to be massive. So um, if the swim goes well and they carry, I think England are in with a shout. Um, I think if the French pack maybe get on top, I think it's going to be more difficult. But I think it's going to be a going to be a hell of a game. And they're at different stages, aren't they? Obviously, we know what a successful year France had last year, and obviously Borthwick is just getting his feet under the table. But he's kind of stripped it back, and it is very forward oriented at the moment. When you were playing for England, Borthwick was the forwards coach in those early days under Eddie Jones. So yeah. what have you what did you make of him back then and what do you make of him now? 
I think he's he's a very good coach. Um, very technical, very specific in what he what, what he wants, and the game plan that he would have given to the lads will will be will be relatively structured. Um, I think that England have kind of gone back to the set piece, kick possession sort of style of play, and maybe a bit, bit but that might just be at the beginning. I think maybe closer to the World Cup, they might they'll probably try different other other different styles of playing and see which one suits them the best. Um, but he's a very very good coach. And I think um, he's a good man to take over the England team and, and lead him into the World Cup. And so given that relationship that you already have, given the fact that you're only 32, you must look at Dan Cole back rocking and think, I can do this. Do you think there's a bit of unfinished business for yourself as well with England set up too? Um, I kind of accepted that, um, you know, a year or two after I got dropped by the age, just, um, my, my time was done and I was... Um, you know, proud and felt privileged to get to get sixteen caps, and um, and that's one of the reasons kind of moving over to France. Really, I'd kind of accepted that you know my my shot with England uh, um was was done, and there were a few good young titans coming through, and maybe now is the time to move away. We spoke with Henry Thomas last weekend, yeah. um, and he just gave like looking back on the camps with Eddie and the conversations. He was talking as well about how Eddie said, "Look, sum yourself up in three words." He answered really wrongly and never got asked back. So <laughs> like these things yeah. happen. But when you look back with your conversations with Eddie in that time in the England camp, you said really proud to have 16 caps, but is there an itch to have more as well? Or is it completely put to bed? Yeah, I'd love to have more. I think obviously be, be like, silly of me to say that I, that I never want to, that I never want to, or never want to play more for England. Um, but yeah, that, yes, just accepted it, I suppose. Like I'm not, I don't want to, you know, look back with the regrets or, um, you know, any bad memories. I felt like I, I was out of form and a couple of rubbish seasons playing, to be honest. Um, and Eddie said that. He just said, you're not playing very well. Um, you know, there's young lads coming through and um, now's not your time. I, was like, I just accept it. Was that it? Because you mentioned those conversations were brutal, but sometimes, I mean, Johnny mentioned Henry we had on last week, but other players have sort of talked about Eddie in terms of, the way he approaches things, his management style, and often it is to kind of get a reaction and and motivate players. Did he ever kind of have any interactions with you like that? Um, yeah, there was a, there was a few interesting conversations. Um, nothing like out of this world, though. Nothing like story worthy. Uh, and <laughs> he basically t- he basically told me, um, "You playing shit? <laughs> um, you need to work harder." Um, get fixed. I was injured for a little bit. Get back fit. You know, have more impact on the game. Just general things like that. Um, yeah, just it was it was near enough. Um, every every tour we had, he'd give me a call before maybe I think maybe three tours, and he just said, "Look, you're you're not you're not you're not coming. Um, get, play better." But he kept in touch, which was good. He obviously sort of saw that that he potentially had you on his radar. <laughs> Yeah, I think I just wasn't consistent enough. Like I'd, I'd play okay one week and then the next week I was terrible or, and kind of like that for a year or two. Um, I think he was obviously after, you know, someone who was performing at the highest level week in, week out, which wasn't me at the time. And part of those 16 caps, mate, you did take part in the 2015 World Cup and it's still talked about loads in terms of everything that happened around Sam Burgess and different characters. Um, but what was that like to be part of? The characters and also just being part of the World Cup generally? Yeah, it was an unbelievable experience. Um, something which I look strangely look back on as a as a proud moment for me um, to to play in England in an English world like for England in a in a World Cup is something I'm going to be proud of. How we performed and how the World Cup went for us is obviously was a bit of it was a disaster. Um, to be involved with something like that and you know the the build up to it and and everything and the, the kind of the hype around the World Cup was was amazing and um, the players that were in camp were all great pre-season was good I mean, it was one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life um, <laughs> up, at, up at altitude in, in, in Denver 2000 meters above sea level um, yeah I, I had a I had a good time at the World Cup and, but just the games and how we played and our results just, just obviously weren't good and you mentioned what Steve Borthwick was like from your time with England obviously that World Cup was under Stuart Lancaster who is yeah. moving to Racing to coach next yeah. season. So give us an insight into what he was like and how you think he'll get on in the top 14. I don't know how he's how he'll get on over here. I don't know how much French he can speak, which uh, will obviously help him massively. 
But again, I, I also I really really like Stewart. I think he was a, a really good coach. Um, and you only have to look at what he's you know he's been doing at Leinster, um, building a very very successful team. And I think that you know you bring his passion and his um, coaching ability to any team in the world, and I think it's only going to get better. Um, so I think I think he, I think he'll do very well over here. Yeah. You say really, like I'm the same from the outside looking in, watching that England side 2015. I was like, the product was phenomenal, but just didn't quite go right in those couple of games, which ruined the World Cup. You look at Leinster, the product's terrific, but you and I both know coming over to France is also a different kettle of fish and that you can be technically superb, you can be very organized, but then if you don't get the communication bits right and you don't get buy in, it can be really difficult. So, how do you see that going? Like again, a head coach coming in, I know he's taking French lessons and the yeah. off field stuff and the leadership bits that you do, everyone looks at with incredible esteem and, and high regard. But how do you think that's going to be coming in and leading a primarily French setup in French? That's going to be a massive tat challenge from too. Yeah, it's going to be enormous. Um, I think if you look at people like Ronan Ron Nagara that's gone over, to, gone over to La Rochelle, I think he's doing obviously very, very well. Um and I think the French thrive off passion, um, passion, and you know, love of the game and emotion. And I think if he goes, if he goes over and kind of shows that Racing team kind of what what rugby really means to him and how much he wants the team to to, to succeed, I can't, I can't see him going wrong. I think I think he's going to do very well. And you had a decade in the Premiership, and you mentioned kind of not being involved with England was maybe a slight motivation, a lack of form in terms of your move to, to Toulon. But how did the move come about to France? Um, I think there's always a desire to kind of come over um, and experience something different, new language, new culture, new style of rugby. I always thought the French style might suit me a little bit better, um, a bit more set-piece orientated. Um, you know, I'll... I maybe had a had a look at coming over in in my mid twenties as well, but then when I played for England, um, and the kind of contract was coming up, um, with Wasps and it was ending, and the opportunity to come over to Toulon kind of arose, and I just jumped at it. Just thought it would be, thought it would be a good opportunity to kind of come over. Then you know, I'm thir- I was thirty then, um, and I just thought, go for it. And how did you find that adjustment? You came, you thought it might suit you. You're playing good rugby, but coming to new country, culture as well. How did you settle in initially? Did you find it as easy as you hoped or was it difficult in the first instance? Moving over itself um, was tough. Everything out, out of the home, um, me and my girlfriend coming over, finding a house. Um, Danny, my girlfriend, was 38 weeks pregnant at the time. Ooh, Great timing. Um, <laughs> it, it it was a very stressful couple of months, um, and we actually had no house for two or three weeks of it, um, in between an Airbnb and when we were meant to move into our house because our stuff hadn't arrived. Our stuff was two months late, so when we meant to have, you know, we we would meant to we 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 had meant to set up the nursery cart, everything ready for him, but because it was two months late, we had nothing. So as as uh, Billy, my boy, was born, I was back home unboxing, un- unboxing um, his room, trying to get it ready for him for when he comes back. So that was stressful. Wow. Um, in terms of um, language, culture, everything else around living in France, it's been a great experience. Um, I'm trying really hard with, with French. Um, it's hard. <laughs> um, but the, the culture is brilliant. I love the French people. I love their passion. I love how much they love rugby and um, all in all, moving over to France has been has been a great experience so far. And you mentioned some of your stuff was late, and all the drama around that. It's it's a familiar story. Johnny knows it only too well. Things are done differently over there, and we often hear how if you embrace it, you do okay. If you try and yeah. fight it, you don't. It's very very relaxed. Um, so yeah, I think the stuff being two months late was probably normal for them. Um, but yeah, I know <laughs> in one of our first weeks we. Um, we went for a meeting with with my agent over here and um we were two hours late to the restaurant and as we arrived they just showed us to our table and i was like they hadn't given the table table away or anything like that They're like no no it's france they just uh, <laughs> keep hold of it they know you're gonna be a bit late and that kind of summed it up straight away to be fair so good uh, mate we asked henry the same questions last week but totally important your position we talked about the set piece the important as a prop the physicality, the players, the caliber that you come up against in the Premiership versus the top fourteen. Give us a little insight into the differences 
that you've seen so far? Obviously, there are some world-class players over here. Um, so playing against them week in, week out is is, is great. Um, and, a learning, and a learning curve as well when you're trying to defend against like Colby in training and he just makes you look stupid every week. <laughs> um, but I think, um, like I said before, I think the main difference is how important the set piece is to them over here. Um, a lot of their game structured around you know, a dominant scrum or a dominant ball and kickoffs are very important for them as well. They like to get the ball back and try and play from there. And But then I think you add in there a bit of flair with the kind of X-factor factor players you've got. Um, and you do have a bit of Jue in there as well. I think it's a lot, lot, maybe not a lot, but it's less structured than it is in England. Um, I know previous clubs that I've been at, um, lineouts and scrums, we've had maybe three or four phases kind of planned out. Um, whereas over here, it's a bit more um, one phase, see where we're at, Jue play, give, give the ball to an X-Factor player and let's see what happens kind of thing. Um, not always like that, but a few times like that, yeah. I love it. Give the ball to Kieran, see what he can do. <laughs> Don't give the ball to Kieran, he'll drop it. But yeah, <laughs> like our back three at them, well, a, a possible back three for us is Cheslin, Colby, Juita and Villiers. And I mean, you give the ball to any of them in space. Um, and you know, you're know you looking at something positive, positive impact on the game, aren't you? From a front row point of view, this might be too personal a question, I don't know. But um, there are some absolutely massive human beings. And I think yeah. I'm right in saying towards your end, the end of your time in the Premiership, you maybe lost a bit of weight because that was the kind of style of rugby that was being played. When you move over to France, do you put weight on? Do you lose weight? Is it very different? How does it work? I think every club I've been at has been different. Um, and I think the style of play, I feel, in the Premiership goes on like a... It is in a circle, maybe every three or four years. You go from there being massive emphasis on big props, dominant scrums, um, set pieces, the most important thing, to maybe three years later, coaches wanted a bit more of an all-round, kind of modern-day prop, as we'd call it. And then it kind of goes full circle again and, and clubs are looking for you know another strong set piece and um, what you do in the loose is a little bit less important. Um, I think towards the end of my career in the Premiership with the style that Wasps were playing um, under Lee Blackett, he wanted to play an expansive game with with the props doing a little bit more running. Um, so I didn't lose too much weight. I think I got down I was probably about 132 at, at some points um, throughout my career. But I got down to about one... 122, 123. Wow. It's a fair um, chunk. 10 kilos. I'd, yeah, I'd be chuffed do you know what? Do you know what I did it in lockdown? Um, weirdly, I took up cycling, you know, my hour out a day. Um, mm. So I was cycling every day. Um, I love it. I took up I this thing called exercising. And you just like, <laughs> no, just lost of, all, of, all, of all things to be, to kind of be passionate about. Yeah, it could have been cooking. It could have been anything. But yeah, I got, got really into cycling. Um, and I lost about 10k. Uh, during lockdown, and then put a couple of k back in because I hadn't seen hadn't seen a gym in um, three months. And then coming over here, I thought I'd be coming over, and it would be the stereotypical um, enormous props. We want you big, we want you strong, we want maybe a bit heavier. Um, but when I came, they no, they, they want they wanted me lighter. Um, so I probably arrived about one twenty six, one twenty seven um, after the off season, and then at the moment I'm one seventeen. Um, wow which is probably the lightest I've ever played at ever in, in 14 years. Um, maybe apart from when I was 16 and at school. Um, well, yeah, not, not what I expected, but I think, I'm, I think I am playing better rugby lighter. Um, so I'm, I'm happy enough. And I mean, you're playing with second rows and hookers as well, that are 120 plus. I mean, so the, the, you're not, you're not losing much in the scrum. And that's probably mate the exact inverse of what everyone would think about French rugby versus the Prem everyone would think and me stereotypically having been part of it bigger was better that was always yeah. the fight so really weird nice insight but how are you feeling like do you feel comfortable at that way if you were to jump back into the English squad or jump back to the Prem or would you feel comfortable now because it's a 10% drop of your body weight which is a big chunk for any rugby player any professional rugby player but you must feel way better around the field in terms of your involvement, your ability to get around, to carry, to get off the deck. You must feel a big difference. Yeah, it's massive, yeah. Um, 
I think if I was to have a step back and go to the Prem, I think I'd stay at the same weight. I'd stay at one, you know, 117, 118, under, under 120 is, is where I want to be. Um, and I feel with age as well, I'm 32 now, I think lighter is probably better for longevity, ankles, knees, back. And I want to keep playing. I want to keep going for as long as I can. I've got no intentions of, re- of retiring or no kind of goal, um, age goal. Um, I think it's probably just all round better for me to be lighter. Um, and and hopefully perform better as well. Better for the beach in Toulon. Let's be honest. Ten kegs lighter. <laughs> You're looking better. Yeah. How is life in general, mate? Going from the prem and the clubs you were at to now, sunshine 320 days a year down in the south coast. What's it like in Toulon? The town, the people, the lifestyle. How much are you enjoying that side of things? Yeah, um, massively loving it over here. Um, the we- the weather's brilliant. The weather is nice. Playing in 28, 29 in uh, September is tough, um, but you kind of get used to it after pre-season. Um, the people of Toulon are rugby mad, very, very passionate. You know, you walk down the street um, and you get uh, Pasca Toulon or Ale Toulon shouted at you, um, and everyone's driving around in branded Toulon cars, the badges are everywhere. It's just a massive, massive rugby town. Um, and that's one thing I loved about moving over here is the passion. Um and the emotion that people put into rugby is is enormous and and class to be a part of. Um, and in lifestyle in general, we you know with my with my little boy and my girlfriend over here, um, loving life. He's going to crash. He's eighteen months old now. He's started speaking a little bit of French. Picked picked up a few French words at crash, um, which is strange. Um, but yeah, no, life's good, and and I'm enjoying it. And I've got eighteen months left of my contract, and whatever happens, happens. If if they want to resign me. I, I'd love to stay, and if and if not, then you know, kind of see, see where 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 else rugby takes me. And who speaks the bare French? You or Billy? <laughs> Probably him, to be honest. <laughs> he came back. He came back from crash one day and was um was pointing at things and saying Donny, Donny, and uh, my girlfriend's called Danny. And I was like, why is he shouting your name at random objects around the house? <laughs> and then we found out that Donny means give. So I was like, oh, he's, he actually he wants things, but yeah, he speaks more than me already, and I can't understand him. So we well, don't. He was like, putain, papa, putain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, What's he yet, saying? I don't know. <laughs> It'll come, mate. It'll come. Yeah, Tell he's you. brilliant. Yeah, but w- when when my contract's up here in three years, he's he's going to be three, and I reckon being bilingual will set him up, set him up well for wherever we go next. Absolutely, and we've spoken a little bit already about international rugby. Aside from your career, more broadly. It is a big topic of conversation at the moment because the sort of rules in Wales are changing. There's different rules in every country. From your point of view, what do you think? Because there's a lot of foreign stars playing in the top 14. And we know a friend of the show, Zach Mercer, is moving back ahead of the World Cup. He can therefore be selected. Do you think that players nowadays should be able to play wherever they want in terms of their club rugby and still be selected? Or do you kind of see where the rules in England and different countries coming from it's a hard one isn't it um i think the model of keeping your homegrown players in the league is good for the league um it keeps the strength of the league there like you look at the the premiership the reason it's so strong is because it's it's full of homegrown players that that all have aspirations to or most have aspirations to play for england and to play for England, you have to stay in the prem i think um one hard thing about coming to France is 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 the regulations over here about the GIF and non GIF. There can only be, I think, it's an average of six or seven, and that might even be dropping next year. So I think the opportunities over in France might get less um, for for foreigners because they they are maybe taking a similar um, a similar thing that to what England are doing in trying to keep the top fourteen mainly homegrown French players. I think it's only it's only good for the players themselves. To go and experience a different league, a different way of playing, I think is going to improve them personally. Um, but in terms of keeping the league strong, I think I think England have got it. I think England have got it right, and I think France have as well. It's a good mix of kind of foreigners and 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 the, and the French. And on that, mate. So, how would you say that's improved use? We've talked about the physical aspects already: a bit of weight change, a bit of confidence, lighter, and playing really well. But also in terms of the different personalities and styles of playing, like you're in a team with Dan Bigger, Charles Olivon, Villiers, you mentioned Colby. In terms of your personal development, 
how has that helped you? And, and then secondary, what are those blokes like as well to play with? Like it must be a completely different level. Yeah, I think coming over and experiencing a different league, a different league, you have you have different, um, like I said before, different styles of play and different players playing against you. Like being in the in the Premiership, you know, um, after what was it, thirteen years of playing the Prem, um, I played in every stadium, I played against every team, home and away, and I think it it doesn't become boring or anything like that, but it can be a bit samey. I think a new opportunity in a in a new league against new teams, against new players, um, under different coaching styles and management. Um, you have to adapt and, and and get better in that sort of way and and yeah, improve there. Um and in terms of playing with those players, um, you know, you see their work ethic and um professionalism and um again passion for for the game. Um and it makes you want to want to want to buy in and, and get better yourself, so you can help them and you can help the team and and try and pick up some silverware. And so on those people, I like mentioned Colby, Olive on a guy I wanted to ask you about is the importance of Dan Bigger since he arrived. We saw, yeah. yeah, like he arrived in the stadium, first presentation to the entire stadium was speaking French, and I was like, right, yeah. okay, this boy's got his head screwed on. But how big a difference has he made to the squad since he's arrived, and the impact he's had on the playing side of things as well since arriving? Yeah, he's brilliant. Um, to speak the amount of French that he spoke when he first came over um, w- was next level. Um, and I think his, um, he's having less, three, like three-hour lessons a day um, to try and get better. Cause I think it's, it's it's hugely important for a 10 to speak to, to speak French um, to the other players. Maybe not so much as a, as a tight head. I don't really, I don't do much speaking to it, but I think his, <laughs> his, his leadership and you know the control he has to have on a game. I think speaking French is is huge, and I think he he, he knows that. So his French is unbelievable. Um, and in terms of his work work ethic and his ability, you know, I, I sat next to him when um, when he watched his first game, and he had a, a notepad in the stadium, and was taking notes throughout the whole game and plays and where he thought we could improve and and things like that. So his prof- prof- professionalism is is next level. And off the field, have you helped him settle in? Obviously, as someone who'd been there a year or so already, have you been helping him settle in? Yeah, try to. He's, he's only been here a short a short while because obviously he went back um, to, work, to work with Wales. Um, but we've been for a bit of sushi and a coffee and stuff and just kind of talked about general life and um, things that maybe made it easier settling in over here and the hardships of moving and um, but he seems to have taken it, you know, in, in his stride and he's he's doing very well. Um, and I think he's back back in a couple of weeks after the Six Nations. Um, and then his whole family moves over. So I think he'll probably feel a bit bit more at home then. You mentioned as a front rower, you don't have to say a lot. Whether it's in France or in England, I'm intrigued by the amount of chat in the front row. Is there more or less in France? And who are the biggest kind of front row characters you've come up against? Um, but back in England, obviously Sinclair and Genge are both, are both big characters. Um, uh, Max Laheef, um, oh, yeah. he's very funny. Um, I played against Jan Thomas since I was 17, 18, um, when he was playing for England 18s. Um, and he's always, you know, nothing nasty, but he's always having a bit of a smile and a laugh. Um, over here, I think people just tend to not speak to me because they think that I don't speak any French. Um, which I, which I don't mind. I, you know, I'm not a massive talker anyway. Um, but off, the, yeah, no. Does the, I'd say it's 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 similar. Probably got probably got a, a little bit more um, a bit, bit more banter in England. Probably because I could understand it. Who's the most impressive that you've come up against that you hadn't played against before, and you thought, "Holy shit, this guy is next level." Not necessarily in a in a in a game, but in training. Uh, Jibé Gros. Uh, when I arrived, he was 22. Your old Lucer playing international rugby, playing very, very well consistently week in, week out. Um, I couldn't go over that. Is um is scrummaging is um is next level. And for a twenty two year old, you could have you know, another ten years playing international rugby. I think he's gonna have a hundred cups very easily with him and Cyril Bay in the front row. I think France are very lucky to have those two loose heads. Um and from other teams, um the La Rochelle, Antonio. Winnie Antonio. Um, yeah, just the size of him and his scrummaging ability, again, was just something that was left me in shock. I remember <laughs> seeing him for the first time in a tunnel, and I was almost like that, looking up at him like, <laughs> how, how are you that big? <laughs> You're enormous. <laughs> yeah, but he's a very good player. 
you mentioned you've got a couple of years left until and you're obviously loving life out in France. You're only 32, but I don't know if you've given any thought to what you might do when your playing career is over, because I heard that you went to drama school as a youngster. So next James Bond? Oh, God, that's going to haunt me for the rest of my life. That is. Um, so when I was at school, uh, I did go to a bit of drama school, yeah. Um, and um, I was part of an agency in, in Blackpool. Um, and they basically needed needed an extra to be in Coronation Street. So, yeah, I gave it a go. Um, and well, I've never lived it down since. There's clips everywhere. But no. Can I we find it on YouTube? Is, it, is there anything we have to put in to find <sighs> it? I can't, I can't remember. Oh, no oh come on. <laughs> I don't think it's on YouTube. I think it was probably an old clip of Coronation Street from 2007 or whenever it was. Um, I might have it on my uh, on my photo reel somewhere. I might, <laughs> I, might be able to dig, I might be able to dig it out. Um, but in terms of career after rugby, um, I do love scrummaging. Um, and I do love rugby. Um, I am passionate about it. So I would love to go into coaching. Um, I worked a little bit with uh, the Academy at Wasps. Um, just coaching kind of the lads that were coming through 17, 18, 19 year olds that were making that transition from academy, academy into first team. Um, and, and I just really, really enjoyed it. Um, you know, I'm taking, I'm taking my, um, my level two, uh, which is hard to do over in France. So I'm trying to work a way of doing it back in England. Um, but hopefully with the, with the possibility of then taking my level three, when I eventually move back to England and trying to, trying to pursue a coaching opportunity somewhere. Very cool. And mate, as somebody that's been part of the club, coached the youngsters, played a number of games there, what have you made? Like watching from afar everything that's happened to Wasp over the past 24 yeah. months, what have you made of the situation? Absolutely brutal, isn't it? Um, you know, I think I think it was 162 players and staff um, were made redundant. Um, and it's just horrific, like seeing, seeing and speaking to the boys that uh, have no job and um, are looking for anything, any gig to go and play at. Um, I've heard silly numbers that were getting thrown around that the clubs are offering for minimal money, just just because they know that the lads are desperate, which is mm. which is obvious. Um, but yeah, it's it's horrible, um, but it's good to see that a lot of the lads there have, have got opportunities elsewhere, and and the same with Worcester. It sounds like they'll be back next year in the Championship Wasps, at least. Yes, I think so. Yeah, um, and maybe with a three, four, five year plan to get back up to the up to the prem, which would be good. Good for rugby. With a new scrummaging coach. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be that would be very nice. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm very disappointed that you're not going to take a acting anyway. Was it? Were you in shame, Shameless as well? You've been in other things as well as Coronation Street. I was in. I was in Coronation Street. Um, shameless. I'm, I'm no like huge roles. I was literally just in the background. Um, <laughs> Mate, there but, has um, to be. You have to have a showreel. Some there's no way you've done this, <laughs> and somebody hasn't clipped this up. This is going to have to go viral. Did you not also uh, do bits when you're at Northampton as well? Oh, that was just in um, yeah, Ethan Waller. He yeah. very funny. Another very very funny um, funny character prop. Um, but he, he used to put on a Christmas nativity every year. Um, and me and Ben Foden were Mary and Joseph. Who was who? Um, who, who was who? I was Mary. Yeah, <laughs> that makes no sense. <laughs> I know he was, he was Joseph, so I wore these den denim hot pants and I had to put a pillow up my uh, up my jumper and walk around like a pregnant Mary. You know, the next question is: there any footage of this anywhere or not? I don't think there is. No, thankfully, <laughs> it was uh, it was uh, paid tickets just for charity, so so the the fans came and watched. I don't believe it. I'm like, there, there's footage of Ben Foden doing absolutely everything everywhere. So I am sure there there's going to be amazing. It'll be floating around. We'll find it. Don't worry. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming on. And um, great to hear about everything from Coronation Street to the, the top 14. It's been brilliant. No problem. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the rest of your holiday too. Thank you very much. Kieran, obviously, loving life in France. And um, given that he's just been up Mont Blanc, who wouldn't, Johnny? Well, that's it. We didn't mention that or reference it at the start, but he's up Mont Blanc, up there skiing in the sunshine, sat from sat from a chalet somewhere chatting to us. Um, they were given seven days off holiday, then they won their game last weekend, and the coach said you can have an extra four days off. That never <laughs> happened to me. I don't know what happened, but mate, great to have him join us. Uh, lovely big guy. He's going really well in the top 14 as well and clearly loving life. So um, 
Hope it continues for him. Hope he picks up another extension. And yeah, jealous. Like the top of Mont Blanc looked absolutely phenomenal there. And he's clearly, you know, not looking at England right now. He's enjoying life in, in France. But it's interesting that he goes over there. He's lighter than he's ever been. He's arguably playing better than he's ever played. And, you know, you never know what might happen. You never know what's going to happen. Rugby moves really quickly. Um, we've seen Zach Mercer, who's moving back in the summer. How quickly will he be back involved in the setup with England? We don't know. Um, but that's it. France is a funny old environment, a funny place where it is different, but that can fit some people and it brings out the best in a lot of players. We talk about the continued personal development as well and how it opens our eyes and exposes you to different things. And that is the beauty of the top 14 is it's very varied. You're playing as different people. Each team is multicultural and you figure things out. And look, there's another guy that's come over and he's excelled. So um, like brilliant to do him, to see him doing so well. And who knows, like you mentioned, he is only 32. He's got 18 months left on his contract and quite easily could still do a job for England. So we'll see what happens. And on the England-France game this weekend, we chatted to Kieran about the front row battle. You reckon yeah. or Dorian Aldegheri perhaps coming in for Mohamed Hawass. Yeah. Who comes in for Anthony Geelong? And any other changes? Is there word that Jonathan Dante might be back in or not? Uh, well, weirdly, we don't... Well, today's the first training day they've had together. Um, so last week was a week off. So Aldegheri will probably come back and start. Falatea, I think, will stick on the bench. Anthony Jalange had his knee reconstruction done, I think, over the weekend. So good luck to him with his rehab. That starts now. He'll be a bit sore. Bless him. Uh, I don't think too much will change. It might even mean that Fabian reverts back to a 5-3 split in that Francois Cross will probably start the game. Makalu will still be on the bench. Um, the only other point you mentioned is Jonathan Dante with Mo Fana. He's not really set the world alight. Like he's been okay. Um, but there's a position there that they could really do with the focal point and the sort of physicality that they've maybe not been able to stamp. Joe Dante could bring back in. So that would be the three changes I would make. Um, Aldegheri, Cross and Dante back in for England. But I guess we'll find out on Thursday. Right. We'll have a quick chat about the top 14 shortly. But let's first find out what your meter moment of the week is, Johnny. So mate, I was working for Viaplay um, in Paris on Sunday night and I was covering Racing against Toulouse in a game that genuinely I didn't expect to lose to really do much. And Finn Russell was back for Racing 92. They brought out the big guns. Toulouse really mixed side, uh, peppered with youth. Their tight head props were 21 and 22 years old, but they were absolutely phenomenal. They ran in, I think, five tries, 39 points to 35. They won it away from home. Nobody expecting. They were scoring from coast to coast, tries running out from turnovers in their 22. Um, their scrum half, who come in from Agen, phenomenal. Paj Rello's away with the international camp. Paul Grau's come in from Agen, and he was superb. But just generally, their ability to play offload. Manny Miafu was absolutely phenomenal again. And so the moment of the weekend was from Toulouse. They were sensational in a game that they did not have any expectation to win, but they nearly notched up 40 points in Racing. They were insane. So meter moment of this weekend was Toulouse's big win at Racing 92. There we go. That was Johnny's meter moment of the week. And meter is the world's number one wireless meat thermometer, recently making over 20 million cooks better with their game-changing app and completely wireless Bluetooth meat probe. You can use it on a barbecue, in the oven, or in a pan, and you can get your hands on one at meter.com. Plus, you can get 10% off any full price item. All you have to do is enter the code FRENCHPOD10 at checkout. That's FRENCHPOD10, and you get 10% off any full price item at meter.com. Toulouse getting the meter moment of the week, Johnny. But Zach Mercer must have been up there again. 10 defenders beat Mate. or something. Every Mate, week. Not far off. Um, he's just a freak. Uh, again, it's a phrase that's a real compliment in the rugby world, but the, for a guy that's not overly big, the physicality, the technical ability, the handling, like he created a try by dummy, like dummying her through his legs pass and then offloading on his five meter line and creating a length of the field try. Like he's got everything. He's even jumping in line out too, which he didn't do in years previously. He didn't do back in England. Again, expanding his skill set over here in France, but like he was top 14 player of the year last year. He isn't far off this year. Like it'll be somebody that wins the top 14, he'll be awarded to. But in terms of his individual performances and what he does every single week, he's consistently superb. So 
I, I run out of words to use with him. The guy <laughs> is just, he's phenomenal to watch. At the other end of the spectrum, things are looking pretty desperate for Reeve. They lost yeah. at home to Bordeaux. Perpignan won. Poe didn't beat La Rochelle, but they looked pretty good. Mm-hmm. What is going on with Brief? Because they're a bit adrift now at the bottom. We spoke earlier on in the season about how there was no investment there. They were being ambitious. What's going on? Well, the investment doesn't come till next season. Um, so the squad they've got is still the squad they've got. They brought in Patrice Colazzo. But is it going to be enough? Is you know, you've got Cass bringing in Jeremy Davidson. Perpignan after that win against Bayonne, they're on 34 points, sitting in 12th, Poe on 33 points. Brieve are now 26, and they're in real danger of running out of games. That is the worry for them, is that it seems that Perpignan have kind of pulled the finger out of their arse, and they're performing well, and they're still backing themselves and playing good rugby and scoring tries, and Brieve, whether it's the quality of player, or whether it's the belief, or whether the change in staff hasn't been enough, there just hasn't been enough of a change in the way they play. And now you know, eight, seven, eight points off pole, you're really starting to get worried about them now. Um, and it's going to be difficult. Like, it's not going to get any easier. If you look at the rest of their fixtures as well, there aren't any easy games. Um, so, yeah, worrying times for brief. And off the field, any transfer gossip in France? A few. Um, Pete Samu, the Wallaby number eight, who he's kind of been in and out, but in terms of super rugby and the games he started for the Wallabies, I reckon he's been the best starting back rower um, in terms of physicality and what he brings. So he's looks like he's had a two-year contract at Bordeaux. Uh, Gela Aprozidze to Bayonne. He's at Montpellier playing second fiddle to Kobus Reinach by his Gif, um, which is a big coup as well. Bayonne, they've been starting with Guillaume Rouet all season. He's been... Oh, he's been ridiculous. He's still running age 34, 35. He played with me. Um, and it looks like, oh, who's the... It looks like Maxime Machino, sorry, um, might get out of that contract a year early and that he hasn't had much game time at all this season. Um, so Aprozidze to Bayonne. Um, and they've had some serious dealings in the transfer market already. Marcos Kremer assigned to go to Clermont. He's been big again this year for Stade Francais, but that looks like if he goes there, Lavanini will have to leave. Um, and the other one, which is a strange one, is Melvin Jaminet. And he, again, kicked something like 20 points at the weekend for Toulouse. He signed a big contract with them coming from Perpignan, but it looks like already Toulon might be interested in buying out his contract and taking him down there. So a few things moving and shaking in the top 14, as it always is. Um, and yeah, watch this space. There's a few more to be announced next weekend that hopefully we can bring to you too. Thanks, Johnny. A big thanks to Kieran for joining us and thanks to all you guys for listening. Make sure you hit subscribe, leave us a nice review if you can, check us out on Rugby Pass and on YouTube and we'll be back with another episode next week. Bye-bye, Johnny. Cheers, Tim. Bye.